All right. So, welcome to part two Dose. of the first subversive history podcast on the ethnic cleansing of Palestine by Young Pape. I understand that's a little convoluted that we have our first one that's broken up into two parts. So I guess this is kind of the second podcast, but it's also just a continuation of the first. So you can make sense of that however you feel comfortable. Um, this thing just was going to be a little bit too long. And, you know, we can definitely grift a little harder with two separate videos. So, um, like, I'm certain that if most people can follow, like, you know, the, the, the plot lines of most TV shows that, like, a podcast of a Twitch stream that's two parts of a book that we've already covered, they'll follow. They, yeah. They got it. Well, and that's the thing. I was thinking about it, too. I was like, oh, man, this thing's so long. But then I was like these two parts of this podcast together is still like less than one of our Twitch streams. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah no, together. so, you know, if, if our, if our objective is to like find an audience that might not sit through 30 hours of content about a single book, I think we're still achieving that. Yeah. I hope that like, you know, for, um, the, the fans, right. Of the works that we cover and like the way that we cover it, right. That are doing their, uh, commute to work you know, or just like doing their mind numbing job and, or just like, you know, I want to see what, uh, what my boys are doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I want I want to hear more about the book. Yeah. Right. So we did a little bit of an introduction in the last one. I'm not even going to do it again. Cause a, I don't want to waste time and B, you probably right. should have already watched the first one. If you're what right. the fuck, what the fuck are you doing on yeah, part two? Like go listen if to If you part haven't one. watched part one. Yeah. So, uh, with that being said, we're going to get, we're going to resume where we left off. In the last episode, we talked about the book, who the author is. We talked about the early formation of Zionism. We talked about sykes Pico, World War I. We talked about the establishment of the British Mandate of Palestine. We talked about the events and the, the, the kind of like administrative choices of Britain that kind of created this very unequal um, playing field in terms of the Zionist paramilitary groups and the Arab population that we're going to end up fighting each other in this war that we're going to talk about on this episode. Um, and then we talked about the uh, Britain's bowing out of the British mandate of Palestine and pretty much leaving an entire just like absolute war going on. Britain just literally destroying a country. Yeah. Um, and, and by country, I mean a people yeah. within that country. And then we talked about the UN partition plan, which was also just not great and very much favored the Zionist project. Um, so now England's out. UN has made their decision. 52% or 56% of Palestine is now this thing called Israel. So now we have to see how is that going to play out. And what's important to know is that all those Arab civilians that were living in what is now considered Israel are now Israeli citizens. Right. So, and they're supposed to be granted full civil and political rights under that state. Right. So let's see how well Israel respects not only the rights of the citizens living in what is now Israel, but also the Palestinian state that right. neighbors. Let, let's see how good Israel is treating its, uh, you know, indigenous population prior to anything like uh, Hamas doesn't exist yet. Uh, the, the, the PLO doesn't exist yet. Nope. Uh, n none of the, the things that you would probably recognize of Palestinian <laughs> politics today exists yet. So the first thing we're going to talk about here is this thing called Plan D or Plan Dalet. Now, um, this is a plan that, according to Ian Pape, we're going to read right from the book here, that it was this plan, Plan D, that sealed the fate of the Palestinians within the territory the Zionist leaders had set their eyes on for the future state of Israel. Indifferent as to whether these Palestinians might decide to collaborate with or oppose the Jewish state, Plan Dalet called for the systematic and total expulsion from their homeland. Um... So this is kind of like where we can start seeing the systematic evidence that corroborates Ben-Gurion saying we need a higher percentage of Jewish people and a less percentage of Arab people. And there's only, there's only so one many way ways. To, that, that, there's only so many ways you can achieve that. Exactly. <laughs> right. So uh, Al, uh, Elon Pape goes further to say prior to March 1948, the activities of the Zionist leadership carried out to implement their vision could still be portrayed as retaliation for hostile Palestinian or Arab actions. However, after March, this was no longer the case. 
The Zionist leadership openly declared two months before the end of the mandate it would seek to take over the land and expel the indigenous, indigenous population by force, Plan Dalet. So, um, from the Wikipedia page, it does say that, you know, if from the plan itself, there's a couple controversial paragraphs. So, uh, the plan states that mounting operations against enemy population centers located inside a near our defensive system in order to prevent them from being used as bases by an active armed force, these operations can be divided into the following categories. Destruction of the villages, setting fire to, blowing up, and planting mines in the debris, especially those population centers which are difficult to control continuously. Uh, mounting search and control operations according to the following guidelines. Encirclement of the village and conducting a search inside it. In the event of resistance, the armed force must be destroyed and the population must be expelled outside the borders of the state. Um, so, you know, this is after, right, the British mandate period where anybody, any Palestinian, like, person with a, a firearm is possibly looking at being executed like extrajudicially right yep. like, so just probably being shot right outside their home if not languishing in like a prison that is just uh awful right uh and then being hung so yeah the plan goes on to say that in the absence of resistance meaning there's no resistance Garrison troops will enter the village and take up positions in it or in locations which enable complete tactical control. Huh. The officer in command of the unit will confiscate all weapons, wireless devices, and motor vehicles in the village. In addition, he will detain all politically suspect individuals. In every region, a Jewish person will be appointed to be responsible for arranging the political and administrative affairs of all Arab villages and population centers which are occupied within that region. So this goes on to say that, let's say that there's no resistance whatsoever. Because you can kind of find like a terminology in here where it's like, oh, they're talking about enemies. They're talking about the people that aren't going to accept it, that you're going to have to right. go to war with. So they're saying in the case that there's no resistance. So let's say you're a village that says, hey, this is Israel now. We're Israelis now. Right. Even if you say it, they're like, all right, great. So we're going to send a platoon in there. It's going to completely disarm you. It's going to take all your cars, all motor vehicles. So any farm the, equipment or anything like that? I don't that? know if it, you know, I don't know if the uh, tractors and shit like that. I mean, it, I says, mean, it says all motor vehicles. All motor vehicles, you so, know. And then not only that, we can detain anyone who is politically suspicious, which is... What does that even mean? It's so vague that I can't even really make sense. Well, of it. Here, here's the other thing. And then also like, in every region. So if say you have some kind of political structure in every right. region, a Jewish person will be appointed to be responsible for arranging the political administrative affairs of all Arab villages and populations. So centers. what do you think the chances are that that person that is, um, you know, being put in charge of these population centers speaks Arabic? Oh, I don't know. Probably, probably pretty slim. I don't know. There was, there was tons of Palestinian Jews though that lived there um, right. for a while. So, you know, just, sure. Yeah. Um, so then I have this thing here. This shows all the operations of Plan Dalet. There's 13 of them, right? Right. And each of these have, could have an asterisk next to them. Okay. So if you read down here, the eight of 13 operations marked with an asterisk were executed outside of the territories allocated for a Jewish state according to the um, demarcations of the United Nations Partition Plan for Palestine and before the entry of Arab regular armies into the areas allotted for the Arab I'm, state. I'm, I'm no mathematician. In fact, I'm bad at numbers, but yeah. 8 out of 13, that's... Uh, that's more than half. <laughs> that's more than half. <laughs> that's like two-thirds. So... <laughs> Out of the 13 operations, and when I say these operations, look, it's like Operation Barak, destroy Arab villages in uh, Barar on the way to Negev, occupy Accra and remove Arabs from Western Galilee, destroy Arab villages and clear out Arab forces between Tiberias and Eastern Galilee. These are the type of what I mean by operations, right? Right. Eight out of the 13 were conducted outside of that state that they were just given by the UN, which means that they're in the Palestinian state. Is that is that what corpus separatum means? Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, and, you know, obviously, you know, they're talking about all this resistance and the enemy and things like that. This also happened, all eight of these happened before Arab regular armies entered 
the Arab state. Oh, okay. So, spoiler alert, like, you know, there will be, you know. We're going to talk about that right now. We'll, we'll, we're, we're about to start talking about that, but it's just like, you can't even use that as like, oh, well, you know, we had uh, these uh, Egyptian or Syrian or, Jordan. you know, Transjordanian yeah. or like Iraqi. terror cells that are going to yeah. fight, you know, that are going to, you know, have a second Holocaust. R- right. That right. wasn't on the table yet. Right. No, these were Palestinian villages that might have some, like, uh, you know, Palestinian organization that is going to fight yeah. for their rights. Like a handful which, of people. And let me tell you, man, I'm just trying to envision this. A, we can already understand why the Palestinian people were like, you want to give over half of my country to, uh, you know, a one, one third of the population. That doesn't seem right. So then, okay, let's say I'm in this. You, What do you mean you're going to come in here, you're going to take all of the cars and the motor vehicles and you're going to take all the weapons and then you're going to appoint these people to administer the political affairs and you can just detain anyone? Like, it seems like you would be like, no, I'm going to fight against that. Right. Well, I mean, like, you know, we, we are 10, 15 years deep on like, you know... Um, the immiseration you, to yeah, these communities you, by the British mandate. Right, like the 10% of like, you know, men 20 to 50 years old... Just died within the past decade. Yeah. Right, like, you know, so that means like it. somebody I know, right, as a, a young Palestinian man, right, or like, you know, when I was a child, right, someone I know, right was was murdered by like you know british mandatory government right or like some kind of like zionist paramilitary right. group bombing like right you know people on a bus right you right. know like it tends th- to radicalize people. this is not fostering a very <laughs> peaceful environment <Yeah. laughs> no so let's talk about how this goes so now we are going to talk about arab volunteers and the ala which is the arab liberation army as well as the arab legion um these are so when israel became established in the UN and this was all happening, the neighboring countries were not so happy about this. They saw this as an affront to the Arab region and like the Middle Eastern people. And like the, the, you know, they looked at this as a colonial project that was chauvinistically settling, settling the land. So you had Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, Jordan, and I believe Iraq. Yeah. All these things constituted Arab volunteers who were going to come to Palestine to assist. Right. Um, And they took various, various forms. We're going to talk about them in a little bit more detail now. So to quote directly from the book on January 9th, 1948 units of the first all Arab volunteer army entered Palestine and engaged with the Jewish forces in small battles over routes and isolated Jewish settlements. So January, 1948 to continue Ilan Pape says, all in all, on the eve of the 1948 war, the Jewish fighting force stood at around 50,000 troops, out of which 30,000 were fighting troops. In May 1948, these troops could count on the assistance of a small air force and a navy, and on the units of tanks, armored cars, and heavy artillery that accompanied them. Facing them were irregular paramilitary Palestinian outfits that numbered no more than 7,000 troops, a fighting force that lacked all structure or hierarchy and was poorly equipped when it came with the Jewish forces. In addition, in February 1948, about 1,000 volunteers had entered from the Arab world, reaching 3,000 over the next few months. So we see here that we have about 10,000 irregular paramilitary volunteers from scattered about the Middle Eastern area fighting a 30,000 strong fighting force that has been trained by the British military, right. armed by the British military, um, supported but, but, by the British military. But Pat, I, I think you're forgetting one thing, and that is that the Palestinian fighting force has no hierarchy. So, Correct. Like, therefore... Well, and also, we're going to talk about, the, <laughs> the, we're gonna talk about the, the hierarchy of all of these states. Because right. after World War I, Syria wasn't even a fucking country. Right. These were also like quasi colonies and right. like Egypt was a British colony. So we're going to talk more about that, but you're absolutely right. So until May, 1948, both sides were poorly equipped. Both sides. Both sides were poorly equipped. It's imp- important to remember both sides. So the newly found Israeli army with the help of the country's communist party received a large shipment of heavy arms from Czechoslovakia and Soviet Union. While the Regular Arab armies brought some heavy weaponry of their own. A few weeks into the war, the Israeli recruitment was so efficient that by the end of the summer, their army stood at 80,000 troops. The Arab regular forces never crossed the 50,000 threshold. And in addition, had stopped receiving arms from Britain, which was its main arms supplier. Yeah, you know, when when Britain's your main guy, you know, uh, uh, like in almost every situation... 
Well, and the British have proved, proven to be completely do- two-faced, it's just, it, bad it, it, actors in this whole situation. <laughs> like, if that's the one that you've been depending on, look at their actions over the past 20 years, and right. you're going to be like, like, we're fucked. <laughs> we're done. And, it's um, like, you know, big, think- big L from the Soviet Union, big L from communist Czechoslovakia, you know, both of these, you know, the, the, the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc were instrumental so, in the establishment of the state of Israel. Right, so that's so, something that needs to be pointed I, out. I, I'm going to pull from like another book that I've read we haven't covered on stream, but like, you know, Domenico Lacerdo in his book Critique of a Black Legend, right? A book about a certain Soviet leader, right? He does talk about how like, you know, the Soviet Union viewed um, the creation of Israel as like kind of like a stopgap because remember how they were pissed at the British, right? They thought that like, oh, okay, that maybe we can you know, like, you know, find like a sort of ally in, um, you know, this new state of Israel against mm-hmm. like, you know, uh, imperialism or, you know, uh, capitalism, but yeah, I don't know. That doesn't hold a ton of water. For no, me. no. I, I have like an uncritical, uh, uncritical denouncement of the situation of funding. It, 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 it doesn't, it's not good. Yeah. It's so we can just good. say that. Yeah. Um, so now we have a little bit more here. So this goes more into Ben Gurion's, Ben Gurion's perspective here. So in February, 1948, Uh, One of his advisors said, we will only have enough troops to defend ourselves, not to take over the country, meaning to take over the whole country. Ben Gurion replied, if we will receive, if we will receive in time, the arms we have already purchased and maybe even receive some of that promised to us by the UN, we will be able to not only defend ourselves, but also to inflict death blows on the Syrians in their own country and take over Palestine as a whole. So again, Ben Gurion no, in no ambiguous language, being like, "I'm coming for all of Palestine." Right. I know they gave us fifty-six percent. I'm taking all that. I want the entire pie. Right. So now let's talk about this again. So the Arab volunteers, the Arab Legion, the ALA. Right. Uh, a, a, a a composite military force of the surrounding Arab countries around what is now Israel and and Palestine. Elon Poppy says this in a very in a very concise way. So many of the Arab leaders were cynical about the looming catastrophe in Palestine, and few were genuinely concerned. Oh. But even the latter needed time to assess, not so much the situation as the possible implications of any involvement on their precarious positions back home. And that's important. They were in precarious positions. Egypt and Iraq were embroiled in the final stages of their own wars of liberation. Right. And Syria and Lebanon were young countries that had just won their independence. Right. This body dragged out its discussions even after the reality in rural and urban Palestine had become too painfully clear to be ignored. And only at the end of April 1948 was it decided that they would send troops into Palestine. By then, a quarter of a million Palestinians had already been expelled, 200 villages destroyed, and scores of towns emptied. And he's, so, he's talking about from like the 1930s up to that point, right? Or like the 19... 19- 20s i guess for what from like british mandatory palestine to uh 1948 all he's saying is that when this is conflict is really coming in and they're, they're saying that you we can start sending these volunteers because this is a big talking point for zionists where they say they they, they treat it like it's like this heroic thing where these, right. these israeli forces we beat five armies they say stuff like that, that okay like, we you know we beat five armies strong like we were the underdogs right, and right, we were right. you know there was this impending annihilation our very existence was at stake right and that's just not the case you had right. this well-funded well-connected to zionist lobbies in america and britain and other european places you had training by the british army funding from you know various sources right and then you have this disenfranchised disarmed exiled imprisoned murdered Im- I- I- impoverished completely immiserated palestinian area and then their support that they did receive but from irregular smatterings of support in much lower numbers from places like syria and lebanon who just won their independence like, right these were the, like, the, like powerhouses barely had an economy these to were speak these of, were the alone. powerhouses yeah. egypt and iraq were literally just getting like going through wars of liberation also right like there's still are colonies they're still like constructing their own government yeah. like while all this is going on exactly so that's something that's important now there's one country that i didn't oh. that i didn't mention correct yes which country is that transjordan transjordan or jordan <laughs> so this is so important too because you know how i said oh we beat five army you know we beat right. the five armies so we just talked about four of them and how that right. they were like they had what, what, what would i call it like moral support 
This yeah, is mostly what yeah, they did. It was like moral support. Yeah. We'll send some guys. Like, homie, we, we got your back. We don't have yeah. a lot. Yeah, we but really we, don't have a we're lot. Gonna send, we're going to send something. We're going to send what we can. Jordan, on the other hand, was actually a very strong and established military presence that could have assisted the Palestinians. Gotcha. If they actually wanted to help the Palestinians. If. So let's talk about this. And I'm going to quote Leon Pape here. The odd man out in this matrix was King Abdullah of Transjordan. Right. He used the new situation to intensify his negotiations with the Jewish agency over a joint agreement in post-mandatory Palestine. While his army had units inside Palestine, and some of them were, here and there, willing to help the villagers protect their houses and lands, they were largely restrained by their commanders. Uh, Fauzi al Kalki's diary reveals the ALA commander's growing frustration with the unwillingness of the Arab Legion units stationed in Palestine to cooperate with his troops. So you have other Arab leaders of like the volunteers being like, why aren't the Jordanian troops like help? Why, why are they making this all so difficult? Right. And if you hear there that they were negotiating with the Jewish agency over a joint agreement in post mandatory Palestine. Let's get more into that. So during this is, Further quoted from the book, during the Jewish operations between January and May 1948, when around 250,000 Palestinians were driven by force from their homes, the Legion stood idly by, the Legion being the Jordanians. In fact, it was in January 1948 that the Jordanians and the Jewish people had cemented their unwritten agreement. In early 1948, the Jordanian Prime Minister had flown to London to report on the conclusion of their tacit alliance with the Zionist leadership over the partition of post-mandatory Palestine between the Jordanians and Israel. The Jordanians were to annex most of the areas allocated oh. to the Arabs in the partition resolution, and in return, would not join the military operations against the Jewish state. The British gave the scheme their blessing. The Arab Legion, the Jordanian army, was the best trained in the whole Arab world. It matched, and in some cases, was even superior to the Zionist forces. But it was confined by the king and his British general chief of staff to act only in those areas the Jordanians deemed theirs. East Jerusalem in the area now known as the West Bank. So, huh. you have King Jordan of Abdullah did have the legion in Palestine, but it was there for one reason. Because to take it. Exactly. To take, so he was like, I'm fine with Israel being set up. Y'all can have Israel. I won't go to war with you over whatever you have there in Israel, but I want all that. Right. All that stuff that's going to be an Arab state in Palestine, I want to annex all that. Right. So that, that's going to be Transjordan. So all these like fighting, fighting are happening and you, you have these other Arab volunteers writing diaries like, why are the Jordanians not helping us? They're here? just kind of standing around. It's because they, they're not there to help the Palestinians. They're not here to push back the borders of the, of the, of the Israeli state. They are simply there to secure what is going to be their colonial territory at that oh. point. So when you think about that, you have these four that are just like, very weak, disorganized, right. new nation, national military. And the only one that can actually mm. like stand their ground and maybe even beat yeah. the Zionist forces, right, is uh, it's, uh, you know, stabbing them in the back. Exactly. Stabbing right. them completely in the back. Right. So although the, Jor this is uh, further from Elon Pape, although the Jordanian army was the strongest of the Arab forces and thus would have formed the most formidable foe for the Jewish state, it was neutralized from the very first day of the Palestine War by the tacit allowance King Abdullah had made with the Zionist movement. So, it's a lot of words from Elon Pape. Let's see what um, Wikipedia has to say about it. Maybe we'll corroborate what's going yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, like, the, for all we know, you know, Elon's just lying, yeah, you know. He might be smoking like, on something, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, in 1946 to 1948, Abdullah actually supported partition in order that the Arab-allocated areas of the British Mandate for Palestine could be annexed into Transjordan. Hmm. Abdullah went so far as to have secret meetings with the Jewish Agency for Israel. Uh, in November of 1947, in a secret meeting, Abdullah stated that he wished to annex all of the Arab parts as a minimum and would prefer to annex all of Palestine. The partition plan was supported by the British Foreign Sec Secretary Ernst Bevin, who preferred to see Abdullah's territory increased at the expense of the Palestinians rather than the risk of the creation of a Palestinian state headed by the Mufti of Jerusalem, Muhammad Amin al-Husseini. So the British are also like, I don't want the the the... The, the Palestinian leadership to even gain. I'd rather deal with, we've been dealing with King Abdullah right. for a minute now. That's right. our guy. Right. I'd rather them take it all. So right. again, it just shows how Britain never gave a fuck no. about the Arabs. And the Jordanians also 
don't have any kind of like pan Arab unity. There, 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 there's no solidarity exactly. with the uh, you know at least King Abdullah and and you know the Palestinian people. And to just further accentuate that, Abdullah too found in the coming war to be unfortunate in part because he preferred a Jewish state as Transjordan's neighbor to a Palestinian Arab state run by the Mufti. Right. And I think we looked into that and like a Mufti is what, just like a religious leader or something like that. Um, I, I'm, I'm not exactly positive, but you know, some form of leadership, you know, so let's, uh, one cap on this thing with the Arab troops and, uh, you know, King Abdullah and how there's, and this is from, uh, Elon Pape as well. Um, so the Arab troops that entered Palestine quickly found out that they had overstretched their supply lines, oh. which meant that they stopped getting ammunition for their antiquated and quite often malfunctioning arms. So this is that like, uh, uh, uh you know, um, threat to our entire existence as Israel. These people that don't even have functioning weapons wait, with wait, no wait, ammunition. Wait. So they don't have functioning weapons. They are outnumbered. And we're not even talking about the, Isra- the uh, Israeli, you know, Zionist troops. We're, we're talking about the, the Arab troops, the Arab troops yeah. that so, allegedly are going to do, you know. Well, let's go here too. Their officers then discovered that there was no coordinating hand between the various national armies and that even when supply routes were open, the weaponry in their home countries was running out. Think about that. Think about five nations with one of them really just like actively trying to sabotage the whole thing so he can take all the land. Right. Think about actually trying to court in 19. It's not like they had like, you know, great, you know, Internet access or something like that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, think about the coordination between these. Right. Versus like, you know, this very coordinated and condensed a Zionist leadership that has have, been being trained for like the last 15, 20 years. Exactly. So weapons were scarce since the Arab army's main suppliers were Britain and France who had declared an arms embargo on Palestine. So <sighs> this is the, you know, because Britain and France were the colonial administrators right. of many of these places right. at the time, just like with, 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 um, Palestine. And now they're like embargo. And then who's the other side of the cold war at this point? Oh, the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc. And who are they supporting? Oh. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, yeah. this is a really very, very difficult and situation. The, for the th- this is, this is not the hour of, you know, Khrushchev either. No. <laughs> so <laughs> this crippled the Arab armies, but hardly affected the Jewish forces who found a willing furniture in the Soviet Union and its new Eastern Bloc. As for the lack of coordination, this was the inevitable result of the decision by the Arab League to appoint King Abdullah as the supreme commander of the all-Arab army with an Iraqi general as acting commander. Wait, 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 wait. So, like, you know, this um, this, this five armies yeah. that, like, they beat back that were planning to crush them and wipe yeah. them out of existence is being led by the guy that they are actively who's meeting with Zionists. Yeah, who's yeah. meeting with Zionists and be like, y'all can chill. <laughs> yeah, just let me like, get all this. Yeah, let me handle all this. Yeah. So it's just like, were you ever really in I, I and I and that's not to say that like there wasn't battles and that there, there wasn't There was definitely dude, listen, to say that there wasn't like, you know, portions of like the right. Arab that there wasn't actual fighting that and stuff. And also like, you know, this type of thing will stoke anti-Semitism. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there's people that might not be, you know, kind of like we were saying before, like maybe they didn't read all the books. All they are is just somebody who had their house bombed or their family killed. And they're probably, right. there's probably Arab people that are like, oh, well, I hate Jewish people now. That probably right. existed. You can probably find a ton of quotes of being like, right. you know, we're going to wipe them out or something like that. You know, like, like I'm uh, sure that my, my uncle existed. was murdered in 1936. But, we, but when we look at the actual like empirical situation here in terms of the amount of troops the coordination, the training, the, the 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 arming, you know, and just all the capabilities. It's not so much of like a this is a threat to our existence. It's more so like this is a great justification for us just expanding, expanding, and expanding because we can right. just say we're under threat right over our border. We're under right. threat right over our border. We're under threat right over our border. Right. You know what I mean? Our border that keeps going further yeah. into these exactly. countries. So, also, I, I just thought about this real quick, and we never talked about this. When we were doing the, uh, the the stream for this book, do you think that a lot of this had any sort of influence on like the anti-Sovietism of a lot of like the pan-Arab, probably, you know, sort of uh, uh, leadership? Yeah, I mean, I, I know that that I would say that that undoubtedly had yeah. something to do with it, but also, you know, I think there was a lot of 
um, Arab countries that looked at Marxism as like a, a anti-religious thing. And they, right. they were just like, this is immediately incompatible that we're going to do like this Arab nationalism, Arab socialism thing that is uh, more right. uh, com- like a, like compatible. A that is more Islam compatible and, with, yeah. not even moderate with it, but like um, uh, uh, just intertwined with yeah. Islamic values. Because yeah, I know that like even, um, what was his name from Egypt? Like, you know. Nasser. The, yeah, Nasser. Like, you know, he had his squabbles with like the Islamic Brotherhood. And we're yeah, just like, oh, you can't even get your own daughter, you know, to like, you know, apply these rules to her life. Yeah. Why am I going to get my entire population to follow this? So just to put a cap on this. So you know how I said that they elected this guy that was like the turncoat of the whole situation and then an Iraqi general? Yeah. While the Jordanians never looked back at those days of May, June, and July of 1948, when they had done all they could to undermine the general Arab effort, the Iraqi revolutionary rulers who came to power in 1958 right. brought the generals to trial for their role in the catastrophe. <laughs> so Jordan never did anything about it, but in Iraq, yeah. they said, you guys fucked over the Palestinians. You're going to trial. That's that's actually kind of based. I'd like to, I have to look more into that. We're just quoting Pape at this point. but So now we're going to move... We, that was a lot of table setting. Yeah. We ta- we set this table, a very elegant table, for a very grim portion of this conversation where we're now going to talk about the actual cleansing operations. Right. These these people that have been immiserated for the last, what, 20 years, right, don't have a single leg to stand on and yeah. don't even have much support to, to really speak of valiant as it may be. You know, it's still not going to be enough right. from day one. So the first operation we're going to talk about is the one that occurred in al Um So in December 1947, so this is def- 1947. So we're not even in 1948 yet. Right. So this is even happening like before the UN partition plan is really even getting figured out. The UN partition plan was 1948. Right. right. So uh, the Palmach, uh, conducted a raid on al Qasis with orders calling for killing adult males in the palace of Emir Faur. They blew up the Faur's house and a neighborhood house, killing many occupants, including women and children. The report from the Palma commander recorded 12 dead, seven, seven men, one woman, one woman, and four children. The first wave of villagers left al Qasis on May 11, 1948. Others left on May 25th, 1948, although 55 villagers remained in their homes and maintained good relations with neighboring Jewish settlements they were eventually evicted. So even if, even if, like you know, you're like, all right, that was just like those guys right in that paramilitary unit, you know, yeah. that, that we've lived next to these people, we've never had an issue, we've always been peaceful, right? Nope. Well, no. even after you think you got your house blown up and a bunch of and children, men, women, and children murdered, it seems like they still existed there for months because this right. happened in Feb in December of 1947 up until May of 1948. Um, it says they maintained good relations with neighboring Jewish settlements. And this is off Wikipedia. Dude, this isn't right. even from the book. This isn't even Papa saying that. And they were still evicted. Good. So when you think about Plan Dalet, where it says, oh, if there's no resistance, we'll figure something out. And, or, oh, this is an existential threat. We have no choice. They're just evicting people that have verifiably good relations with neighboring Jewish settlements. Right. Like, you know, hey, you know, th- things happen. Maybe it was a mistake, you know? <laughs> like, maybe- <laughs> Massacre, uh, which took place on December 30th, 1947. Uh, in mandatory Palestine, as you know, the, this still was technically mandatory Palestine. It began when six Arabs were killed and 42 wounded after the Irgun threw a number of grenades at a crowd of about 100 Arab day laborers. Uh, these Arab day laborers had gathered outside of the main gate of the British owned Haifa oil refinery to look for work. So you have this big oil refinery in Haifa, which is like a main city in, in what is today Israel, but Palestine. Um, and you have all these day laborers that, that, gathered outside and you have this zionist terrorist organization the Ergun, come and just drop off a couple grenades and fucking kill six people and wound 42 others for and, and they hadn't done anything to like according the to this these were just workers it didn't seem like they were like guerrilla terrorist units or anything like that just, these, just workers, these, these were know. guys just outside their job waiting, waiting for work yeah so but then there was a reaction minutes after the Ergun attack arab refinery workers and others began attacking the jewish refinery workers resulting in 39 deaths and 49 injuries right. this came to be known as the haifa oil refinery massacre haganah later retaliated by attacking two nearby arab villages in what became known as the balad al sheikh massacre where between 21 and 70 arabs were killed so it starts with these laborers getting bombed then there is a 
uh, Arab reaction to that where they come and they kill a bunch of Jewish refinery workers, like 39 of them. So then the Haganah come back again. Well, that was the Ergun that started, but then the Haganah come up and they attack two nearby Arab villages in what becomes known as a massacre. Two completely unrelated villages. Well, they were local villages that, oh. that they believed that like that's where they lived. You know what I mean? Right. Um, um, Ian Pape says of this situation, a local commander, Haim Av Inoam, was ordered to encircle the village, kill the largest possible number of men, damage property, but refrain from attacking women and children. This act could be regarded as the official beginning of the ethnic cleansing operation in urban Palestine. The British looked the other way while these atrocities were being committed. So here we have, this is what, you know, Elon Pape says could be looked at as the official beginning of the ethnic cleansing right. in Palestine. Um, so yeah, so we talked about uh, the first village where they were bombing the houses and children died and everything and they were evicting people. Then we have this uh, oil refinery situation which led to, which was instigated by the Ergun and then the Haganah massacred villagers. Right. Now let's talk to a... And this is this is after Plan Dalet or... This is like part of Plan Dalet. Okay. Basically. All right. So Plan Dalet is, is still ongoing throughout oh, yeah. this. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, because I just want to make sure the listeners don't get a little too confused because, you know... Well, the Plan Dalet is just kind of like some of the formal formal rhetoric that accompanied right, these right, operations. Right. Whether Plan Dalet existed, started, stopped, this is still what happened. Right. You know what I mean? Like, right. it doesn't really matter what's on paper. Right. This is what happened. Right. So the next thing we have here, um, this is in January of 1948. So we just talked about two things that happened in like uh, December 1947. And now we're talking about 1948, the beginning of 1948 in January. Uh, this is at the Semiramis Semi Hotel bombing. So a terrorist attack was carried out by the Haganah and the Christian-owned Semiramis Hotel in Jerusalem. After suspecting that the Semiramis Hotel was an Arab headquarters, the Haganah planted a bomb there on the night of the July 5th, January 5th, 1948, the explosion killed 24 or 26 civilians, including at least one child. Among the dead were seven members of the Abu Hussein family and Hubert Lorenzo, the 23-year-old son of the proprietor. The Spanish vice council, Manuel Allende Salazar, was also killed in the attack. So, like, these things just keep out. Like, when you think about, like, you know, these, these Zionist paramilitary forces, it's like, okay... Bombing cafes, bombing buses, setting landmines up in uh, in markets. You killed that lord, uh, the lord guy of from the England. British, yeah, you know? from England. Uh, stringing up British officers and planting them with explosives. Bombing the King David Hotel and killing a bunch of people, uh, innocent people. Uh, bombing a another hotel later where you're killing Dude, Spanish did, vice councils boat that yes. was filled with like Jewish people bombing uh, this killing a Spanish vice consul like these do sound like pieces this is of like, shit this is like they'd add, but I'm saying these are acts of political terrorism that like right like it's just it's just weird that they're not more known about you know right. what I mean like, well I mean I, I guess like you know it why would you want to you know uh zero in on like you know these Terrible things that they did with uh, such frequency when you could just uphold them as, you know, national heroes, I guess. Yeah. So now we'll go into the next of this. So we're, we're going further. This is in February 1948. So we went December, January. Now we're in February of 1948 as this, as this continues. This is where we're going to talk about the Sasa massacre. So in February 1948, Yigal Alan, which is the commander of the Palmach in the north, ordered an attack on Sasa. The order read, you have to blow up 20 houses and kill as many warriors as possible. Now, according to the author of this book, Ion Pape, warriors should be read as villagers to properly understand the order. Oh. So maybe there was like a mistranslation there. According to the guy whose book we're reading, that's he said that it should be read as villagers. On February 15th, 1948, a Palmach unit entered the village during the night and without resistance, without resistance, planted explosives against some of the houses. According to the official history of the Haganah, the village had been used as a base for Arab fighters. However, press reports at the at the time belie this, since the Palmach units met without opposition in the village. The Palmach units that raided Sasa killed 60 people, 5 children, and demolished 16 houses. So, this just goes further to show, for one, you have the commander of the Palmachs 
pretty much giving them like a quota before there's even right. they're even there saying you have to blow up 20 houses and kill as many villagers or warriors as possible. Then you have press reports from the time saying that it was met without resistance, yet still 60 people, five children and 16 houses were destroyed. Right. And, and like this whole like idea that it, even if it is a mistranslation, this idea of like warriors, right? It's just like, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just, I'm not seeing it. Right. I'm not seeing the, the, the warrior. Well, culture. and also, I mean, according to the evidence, it says right there, and that was just all the Wikipedia too. I'm sorry. Like that was just something that I got off right. Wikipedia too. Right. Saying so. that there was press reports at the time that belie this. It's belie, right? That's how you say this? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's belie. Belie. Or contradict this. How about that? Yeah. Press reports at the time contradict this since the Palmach units were met without opposition. Right. And if somebody out there has a problem with it, just, I don't know, edit it yourself. Yeah. Fuck you. <laughs> like, <laughs> So now we're going to talk about one of the more infamous massacres of uh, the 1948 war, which is called Dier Yassin. Right. Uh, so this is quoting um, Ilan Pape here. Dier Yassin, a pastoral and cordial village that had reached a non-aggression pact with the Haganah in Jerusalem, but was doomed to be wiped out because it was within the areas designated in Plan Dalet to be cleansed. So now we're at April. So we were in, we, we, you know, December, January, February. We skipped March. Don't worry about it. Happens. Now we're in April. We can't, we can't list them all. Trust me. We will be here. We could do a yeah. 10 podcast, 10 episode podcast if we listed all of them. Right. And, and, you know, for, for those people that like, you know, have never watched our stream on Twitch um, at uh, twitch.tv forward slash subversive history, no caps, no space. Um, we spend four four hours three days a week you know and breaking down chapters you spend like not even just breaking down chat you spend a lot of time outside of the stream investigating a lot of like you know the claims made in the books that we read about right Mm -hmm. and it's just like you know we literally would be just going through every single village in palestine there's hundreds. It, it, there's hundreds. There's hundreds. When I was first doing this presentation, when I first started getting into these cleansing operations, I was like, boom, boom, boom. By like the second or third chapter, I was like, guys, I just can't anymore because we're literally right. doing 20 at a time. At this like point. it will, we, we will literally just become, we will not read anything else. No more books. Yeah. We, it will just literally be us investigating that. And it's, that's, that's, that's a lot. That's yeah. a lot to like, well, and it becomes just monot- monotonous. You're like, they came in, they killed people. They made everyone leave. They came in, they killed people. They made everyone leave. So let's talk right. about how that played out in the area scene. On April 9th, 1948, uh, Israeli forces occupied the village of Dier Yassin. As they burst into the village, the Israeli soldiers sprayed the houses with machine gun fire, killing many of the inhabitants. The remaining villagers were then gathered in one place and murdered in cold blood. Their bodies abused while a number of women were sexually assaulted and then killed. That is in the vo- that is Ion Pape who stated that. So right. let's see what Wikipedia says about this. Because, you know, oh, Ian Pape, he's so controversial and they say that he lies so much. Let's see. So according to Wikipedia, the Dier Yassin massacre that took place on April 9, 1948, when around 130 fighters from the Zionist paramilitary groups, Ergun and Stern Gang, killed at least 107 Palestinian villagers, including women and children. Some of the Palestinian Arabs were killed in the course of the battle, while others trying to flee or surrender. A number of prisoners were executed, some after being paraded in West Jerusalem, where they were jeered, spat at, stoned, and eventually executed. Good Christ almighty. Yeah. So, you know, and that's another thing, too. You know, there's there's definitely a stereotype of, like, stoning. Right. Of, like, Arab populations and things like that. And it's like, you know, they were subject to that at that time, at times as well. Right. So, I mean... Wikipedia doesn't seem to disagree with old Pape too much. If anything, they added more grotesque detail than he did in his paragraph. So let's talk about another extremely troubling situation that occurred on all this. So we're going to talk about the cast thy bread operation. So now when we were talking about cleansing operations in specific villages, let's talk about something that was like, so you cleanse the people and then you don't want them to come back. So what do you do? You do something like this. So, Cast thy bread operation. This has been confirmed by IDF Israeli archives. In April, Israeli forces began to resort to biological warfare in a top secret operation called Cast Thy Bread, whose aim was to prevent the return of Palestinians to the villages um, that the Israeli forces had conquered and make conditions difficult for any Arab armies that might retake the territory. 
or you know people that lived there right people uh, that have this lived consisted there. of poisoning village wells in the final months of the ensuing 1948 Arab-Israeli war, as Israel gained the upper hand, orders were apparently given to extend the use of biological agents against the Arab states themselves. I'm, so I'm, I'm sorry. You had, the, 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 the point of saying when they gained the upper hand, there, was, there seems to not be a point where they did not have the upper hand. It seems like they kind of just consistently had the upper hand from right. day one. So... What they did is they actually infected them with typhus. The typhoid? Right. Typhus? Is it ty- typhoid? I forget. I, I'm sorry. I haven't looked it up. But they poisoned wells, the right. water supplies for villages. So what they inspel- expelled people, if they were to come back, they would drink poisoned water. Good God. That, that, like, and, and, and this is... Biological know. warfare. Right. Against poor villages. Like, poisoning water supplies is like... Like, don't you plan on taking this for well, not yourself? not even that. It's like, that like, is like, the, you, there is no, it's completely indefensible in any kind of context of warfare. Oh, yeah, no, obviously, yeah, no, but it's just Not like, that much of this stuff is defensible, but I think even the most ardent supporters of, like, the state of Israel have to be like, you can't poison the wells, dude, come or, on. Like, you know, isn't the whole idea of taking it to be repopulated by right, well, your I, I'm not, people? I'm not even so, so concerned about what, how the consequences I'm, I'm just, to I'm them. Just, I'm, I'm just saying, trying to make you know, sense of... The egregious it's, war crime that it's was just, it's, it's madness because it's just like, you know, yeah. isn't the whole reason why you're doing this is to replace, like, the indigenous people with yeah. your own people? So you're, like, literally, like... Well, they'll probably just, like, don't use that well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, what? why? Yeah. <laughs> So now we're going to get into another massacre. This is the massacre portion, guys. Um, and that's unfortunate, but this is the reality of what happened. So we're going right. to talk about the Tentura massacre. And Tentura is one of the more controversial of these massacres. See, there's a lot of stuff, like a lot of denialism oh, and yeah. apologia for what Israeli forces did during the 1948 war. Um, and there's a lot of Israeli historians and other people that claim up and down that oh, that massacre never happened you know this is bullshit and tantora is a great example of this where there was for decades palestinians saying they massacred us in tantora right. and they were like those are lies then in like 1998 theodore katz teddy katz did his dissertation on this which ian pape supported and he was taken to court for interviewing Israeli soldiers that, and survivors that who all said man. that there was a fucking massacre. Yeah. They took him to court and forced him to uh, rescind it. Right. Now, this remained controversial for a long time. Right. If you don't believe oral testimonies of to, Palestinian to, survivors. To, to the point where we even have had comrades that, like, you know, were actually, like, you know, very, you know, staunchly against the Zionist project, even tell us before we started this book, like, hey, you guys should know that, like, Pape has some controversies and stuff like yeah. that. Well, this is one of the ones, as well, that they, they point to him as if he's being some kind of, like... But as time goes on, these accusations of a massacre become more and more substantiated. Right. So I don't want to jump ahead too quick. Let's just talk about what happened and we'll get to the things that have been developing literally as we are doing this project. Right. So the Tantora massacre, which Wikipedia takes no ambiguous term. They don't say the massacre that may or may not have happened. The, the, the Tantora the, battle or yeah, anything like the, that. Wikipedia says it straight up that the Tantora massacre took place on the night of, 20, uh, of May 23rd in 1948, when around 40 to 200 Palestinian Arabs were massacred by the IDF, uh, following the surrender of Tantora, a village of roughly 1,500 people in 1945 located near Haifa. Oral testimonies by surviving Palestinians were met with skepticism. A corroborative 1988 thesis by an Israeli Haifa University graduate, Theodore Katz, who interviewed survivors, was also met with denial. So right. just, to, now, just to further corroborate that. So let's talk about what um, Elon Pape wrote about this. This is from the book. So most of the killing was done in cold blood on the beach. Some of the victims were interrogated and asked about a huge cache of weapons that had supposedly been hidden somewhere in the village. As they couldn't tell, there was no such sack of weapons and they were shot dead on the spot. Good God. Here is a testimony by a Jewish officer um, describing the executions at Tentora. So this is from somebody from the IDF, an officer right. from the IDF, rec- recalling the executions. Prisoners were led in groups to a distance of 200 meters aside, and they and there they were shot. Soldiers 
would come to the commander in chief and say, my cousin was killed in the war. His commander heard that and instructed the troops to take a group of five to seven people aside and execute them. Then a soldier came and said his brother had died in one of the battles. For one brother, the retribution was higher. The commander ordered the troops to take a larger group and they were shot and so on. So essentially what this guy recalls is that a bunch of them are saying, I had a family member that died in this war. And then the commander would be like, take seven of those guys and, and shoot them. Like, imagine if the tables were flipped. Yeah. So, and I, I think that maybe, like, that is what drives a lot of, like, the psychology behind, like, modern Zionist psychology. You know, the same way that the settler psychology is that, mm-hmm. like, you know, what if the tables were flipped? Well, what, what, what retribution, you know, will be, like, met upon us? Right. You know? So, now let's get back to what Pape was saying here. He said, what took place in Tantora was the systemic execution of able-bodied young men by Jewish officers and intelligence officers. One eyewitness, Abu Mashaik, saw with his own eyes the execution of 85 young men of Tantora who were taken in groups of 10 and then executed in the cemetery and, and the nearby mosque. He thought even more executed and estimate, estimated that the total number could have been 110. Um, continuing down that more eyewitness testimony, Fawzi Muhammad Tanj Abu Khalid also witnessed the executions. In the account he gives, the village men were separated from the women, and then groups of 7 to 10 were taken and executed. He witnessed the killing of 90 people. Abu Jabal recalled 125 people being killed in summary executions. Uh, when the rampage, this is still Pape speaking here, when the rampage of the village was over and the executions had come to an end, two Palestinians were ordered to dig mass graves under the supervision of Mordecai Sokoler, who owned the tractors that had been brought in for the gruesome job. In 1999, he said he remembered burying 230 bodies. The exact number was clear in his mind. I lay them one by one in the grave. Do you remember that? I so do. we watched a documentary called Tentora. You can look this up. It's, it's it, well, actually, I don't. I don't want to give too much about that. But there's actually footage of this guy. Yeah. Who? So right now, you have to think of the confluence of evidence that we have right now. We have Palestinian testimony, survivor testimony. Right. We have IDF officer testimony, and then we also have like a random guy a who was civilian. driving a bulldozer. That was driving yeah. a bulldozer. That was like, yeah, I laid 230 bodies in graves. Right. So. This is still met with denial at this point. So at this right. point, this was written in 2006. At this point, this was still completely contentious. The official story right. was this never happened. There might have been a battle. There was no massacre. Innocent people weren't killed. To, to the point where you even have people, right, that like are, are, are Jewish anti-Zionists being like, uh, look, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I don't know. There's some controversy around it. So I don't know if I would, you know. So let's talk about some recent developments, right? Yeah. When I say recent, the first thing I'm going to say is January 2022. So, years after this book was written, yeah. a documentary film on the subject by Alan Schwartz called Tentora, who is another Israeli man. I'm just right. putting that out here. You know what yeah. I mean? This isn't some, like, Nazi guy that's releasing right. anti-Israel. This is from an Israeli Jewish person. He could be making just, you know, Israeli rom-coms right. and cashing yeah. it in. Like So, he made a documentary in January 2022 called Tentora. In this, several Israeli veterans interviewed said they had witnessed a massacre at Tantora after the village had surrendered. Many of the interviewees gave descriptions with the, law, with the numbers of victims who were shot dead from a few to several dozen or more than 200. The latter estimate was provided by a resident of Zikron Yaakov who stated that he helped bury the victims. So again, that was mentioned in Ilan Pape's book. It's again mentioned in the... Um, in the documentary. They affirmed that soldiers in the Alexandroni Brigade of the IDF had murdered unarmed men after the battle had ended and the victims were indeed buried in mass graves. So, after this whole controversy with the student who pretty much got like taken to court and was sued for millions of dollars in libel and Lost after like, everything, people were just like, you know, striking this down. Now, in 2022, you have a documentary with direct testimony from IDF soldiers saying we murdered people right. and we put them in a mass grave. Right. And and by the way, it should be mentioned that like the toll that this had on Teddy Cass's health. Yeah, he's in like a wheelchair now. He's somebody. had like I, three strokes. Go and watch Tentora. Go yeah. and pay the two bucks or whatever it is on Vimeo to rent it. Me and right. Johnny watched it. And it is 
shaking heartbreaking how when you hear these soldiers talk about it it's almost like they're reliving their glory days it's almost like somebody from a frat house remembering how they used to drink and party and stuff like that like they talk about sexual Uh, assault they talk about murder they think about like well it wasn't me but huh man uh jimmy or whatever his name is he was a real savage no no no, they they, they called him a rascal a rascal because he was sexually assaulting and murdering people yeah and it's just the the most like deranged like inhuman yeah it's monstrous doesn't that seem like a lot of evidence it seems like there's a lot there's a lot of evidence what if i told you there's more more what if i told you there's more from the same month that we were doing (laughs) our project on this book (laughs) like literally like a week may 2023 we're recording this in august it it took us some time to get this whole podcast thing together but while we were covering this book in june of 2023 in may 2023 after being commissioned to do so by the Palestinian NGO Adala, the Forensic Architecture Research Unit at Goldsmiths undertook a comprehensive investigation of the historical sources, cartographic and aerial photographic data together with oral testimonies and produced a 3D model indicating the existence of three grave sites beneath the beach resort. And by grave sites, they mean mass grave sites. And by beach resort, we mean they turned this town that had right. a population of people living there for a millennia into a beach resort. So let's talk about that. Um, go to YouTube, look up forensic architecture research and search Palestine or Tentura. Yeah. We watched this on stream. This is stuff that is still coming out today. And if yeah. I was one of those people that believe that was like, there's no evidence that a massacre happened here. There's no, this is, this is, this is all. Uh, right, then then all let us, let us search the parking if lot. If prior to 2022, I was one of those naysayers and, and deniers of this. And then this documentary and this uh, 3D graphicking model came out. I would feel pretty fucking stupid. Yeah. Well, not only would I feel stupid, I'd feel ashamed. Yeah. I'd feel deep shame. You should feel deep shame if you're feeling that. Or if you're, you're so, <laughs> speaking of deeply shameful activity, let's get into the Lid and Ramla, uh, the the Lida and Ramla right. massacres and death march. And this is gonna be this is the last massacre that we're gonna talk about. But um, this is gonna be the last massacre that we talk about. But it's not gonna be the end of the tragedy, unfortunately. No. So let's first start with um. Let's first start with what Wikipedia says about this. So the 1948 Palestinian expulsion from Lida and Ramla, also known as the Lida Death March, was the expulsion of 50,000 and 70,000 Palestinian Arabs when Israeli troops captured the towns in July that year. So we were just talking about April. Now we're moving into July. So this is all one year. So we started, right. well, we started in December of 1947. Right. Well, I mean, the, the, and we've been going little by little. And there's so many in between this, too. Right. I'm there, just talking the, about the really big ones with a lot of content to talk about. Right. There is hundreds right. of these in between. That's, that's the thing. Which, eat, which eat, with each of these that we're talking also, about, there's... Who knows how many well, others going on? Also, it's important to know that pretty much from Dier Yassin on, there was less massacres because you had already terrified the Palestinians. Okay. Like, you, the other ones went a lot more, there's less to talk about because most of the time the people were just like, we need to just escape. We now. need to bail we now. Can't be, yeah. We can't have what happened to them right. happen to us. But, so, um, this was considered the biggest expulsion of the entire war. So the biggest single expulsion of the war happened here at yeah. Lida and Ramla. 50 to 70,000 people. Yeah. That's a lot of people. Exactly. That is... So they, and this was done explicitly to induce civilian panic and flight. And also the Yifta Brigade was ordered to strip them of every watch, piece of jewelry or money or valuables. Now the systemic looting of the people as they left you would think like, oh, they did that so they can enrich themselves, which on the one hand was true, but there was actually a more insidious uh, 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 intention on this. So this was to force the Arab Legion to assume an additional logistical burden with the arrival of masses of indigent refugees that would undermine its military capacities and help demoralize nearby Arab cities. So they were systematically being like, rob them of everything they have. So when they get there, there's, they have to deal with poor people. Like, make it harder uh, for the refugee, the people's taking in the refugees. Because if you let them have all their valuables and then they go there, maybe they can sell some stuff, they can buy a house, it would be more seamless. That's so funny. We have to immiserate and impoverish them so that when they get there, it's more strenuous on the Arab Legion. You, you know what I, I keep thinking about that I can't get out of my head? What? You know how it says 50 to 70,000 people? Yeah. 
How, what were the, what was that number that like the uh, ALA brigades never passed? Like fifty, yeah. So it's like literally like all these people that are in these brigades yeah. trying to like that amount of people is fleeing out of the country, correct? As yeah. they are in it. So the Palestinian historian Aref Al Aref estimated that 426 Palestinians died in Lida on July 12th, of which 176 were in the mosque and 800 overall in the fighting. Um, Continuing here, uh, once the Israelis were in control of the towns, an expulsion order signed by Yitzhak Rabin was issued to the IDF stating the ab- inhabitants of Lida must be expelled quickly without attention to age. Ramla's residents were bussed out while the people of Lida were forced to walk miles during a summer heat wave to the Arab front lines. So this there's, there's a lot of apologia for this massacre because they said like th- there was there was. ALA troops, there was, there was the Arab Legion, they were all in right, there, and yeah. like, this was actually like a like a war hub of like Palestinian insurgency or Arabs insurgency, so we had to do that. So let's talk about the logistics of that. Okay. Palestinian historian Walid Khalidi writes that only 125 legionnaires from the 5th Intra- Infantry Company were in Lida. The Arab Legion numbered 6,000 in all. Some people said that there was like a 1,000 of them there. Right. And it's like, that would be one sixth of the entire right. Arab Legion <laughs> in this one thing. So they're saying that there was about 125 in all and that the rest of the town's de- defenses consisted of civilian residents acting under the command of a retired Arab Legion sergeant. Also, remember that the Arab Legion is the Jordanian forces also. Right. Just keep that in mind also. Right, right. An Arab Legion officer was appointed military governor of both towns, signaling the desire of Abdullah of Son Jordan of to bitch. stake a claim in the parts of Palestine allotted by the UN to the Palestinian Arab state. So were they there to protect Palestinians? Or were they, or they, they there to assist in To not the... lose ground to right. the Israelis. But the legion was overstretched and could not hold the towns. As a result, Abdullah ordered the legion to assume a defensive position only, and most of the legionnaires in Lida withdrew during the night of July 11th. Good God. So, this whole thing that it was like, oh, we had to, you know, you know, this was the heat of battle, and there was all, the, you know, there was all this combat going on, and yeah, four hundred people died, but there was thousands but of legionnaires that e- were fighting. E- wait, even if there are like a thousand, like legion, there's fifty to seventy thousand people. Yeah. That need we're, to be <laughs> like protected. Like yeah. what? So, well, let's talk about this too. The Israeli Air Force began bombing the towns on the night of the July 9th to the July 10th. So think about that. So they're bombing the 9th through the 10th, and then all the the legionnaires leave on the 11th through the 12th. So like right. the bombing in, was intended to induce civilian flight. Ramla's community leaders, along with three prominent Arab family representatives, agreed to surrender, after which the Israelis mortared the city and imposed a curfew. What's that thing that Benny Morris is always saying? That I, there's, there's... I don't really want to get into that because it's going to be a whole talking <laughs> right, point. Right, you're right, that, you're like, right, you're I, right. I don't know if there's going to be enough time to tackle that. Okay. But, um, so, bombing it to induce civilian panic, the Arab legionnaires, they, they never cared about the Palestinians. They just wanted to secure land for right. Abdullah. Um, and then... Ramla's community leaders and three prominent Arab family representatives were like, yo, we agree to surrender. And they're met with mortar fire and the city imposed a curfew. So now this is from Wikipedia, but let's also see what else is here. So Kenneth Bilby was there, who was a correspondent for the New York Herald Tribune, who was in the city at the time, said the Israeli jeep column raced into Lida with rifles, stens, and submachine guns blazing. It coursed through the main streets, blasting at everything that moved. The corpses of Arab men, women, and children were strewn about the streets in the wake of the ruthlessly brilliant charge. So what the fuck? Now, now you have Brit- uh, um, American journalists there that are stating this, which doesn't quite sound like, oh, it was an epic battle between No, it, Arab it, it sounds Aries like you just kind of ran in there and, and started gunning people down. Exactly. So now here's Ian Pape, what he says about it. The same nights, the same sites were observed by a few foreign journalists who were there in that town that day. Two of them were American, apparently invited by the Israeli forces to accompany them in the attack. What today we would call embedded correspondence. Keith Wheeler of the Chicago Sun-Times was one of the two. He wrote, practically everything in the Israeli forces way died. Riddled corpses lay by the roadside. So that's two journalists from America writing about this. It's like, this wasn't so much of a battle as it was, uh, you know. And, and let's see, if they, if they continue this narrative that this was this massive 
volatile insurgent hub that was Lydia and Ramla. Well, according to contemporaneous IDF accounts, groups of old and young women and children streamed down the streets in a great display of submissiveness, submissiveness, bearing white flags and entered of their own free will the detention compounds we arranged in the mosque and church, Muslims and Christians separately. That's it's never a good sign, but 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 even by their own records, there seems to be a great deal of submissiveness and surrender right. going on. Like this right. doesn't quite sound like the language that you would employ against a extremely violent and militarized no, town. Against, you know, warriors, you know. So, um now um Elon Pape goes forward to say, deserted by both the volunteers and the legionnaires, the men of Lid, armed with some old rifles, took shelter in the Dahamish Mosque and the city center. After a few hours of fighting, they surrendered, only to be massacred inside the mosque by the Israeli forces. Palestinian sources recount that in the mosque and in the streets nearby, where the, the Israeli troops went on yet another rampage of murder and pillage, 426 men, women, and children were killed. 176 bodies were found in the mosque. Uh, he goes on to say, more sensitive and less biased was the London Economist, another journalist, uh, as it described for its readers the horrific scenes that took place when inhabitants were forced to start marching after their houses had been looted, their family members murdered, and their city wrecked. The Arab refugees were systematically stripped of all their belongings. Before they were sent on their trek to the frontier, household belongings, stores, clothing, all had to be left behind. Um, so actually we jumped a little bit ahead there. I think I might've structured this wrong because now we're talking about the death march, but there's more about the massacre that happened that I want to read. So we're jumping back to Wikipedia now. Gelber describes what followed as probably the bloodiest massacre of the entire Arab Israeli war. Shapira writes that the Israelis had no experience of governing civilians and panicked. So you have this massive town, 50,000 people, 70,000 people. What? Kelman ordered troops to shoot at any clear target, including at anyone seen on the streets. Israeli soldiers threw grenades into houses they suspected snipers were hiding in. Residents ran out of their homes in panic and were shot. So it's just a, a maelstrom of just a shit show of people that don't know how to handle this. And they're just anything that moves, they're just shooting. And it's a uh, it's it's horrific. So, um, again, Palestinian historian Arif al Aref placed the death toll at 426 um, including 170 and 179, he said, were later killed in one of the mosques. In 2013, in testimony provided to uh, Zakrat, Yera Kamel Kakanovich, a Palmach fighter present on the scene, stated he himself, amid the shelling of a mosque, had fired a Piat anti-tank missile with enormous shockwave impact inside the mosque, and on examining it afterwards, found that the walls scattered with the remains of people. He also stated that anyone straying from the fl flight trail was shot dead. According to Benny Morris, dozens died, including unarmed men, women, and children. An eyewitness published a memoir in 1998 saying he had removed 95 bodies from one of the mosques. And just to summarize it, so, and this is another thing that you hear a lot. Have you ever heard this thing about voluntary, voluntary departure? They yeah, say that, that, yeah. that the Palestinians left on their own accord. Yeah, Benny Morris is, uh... Yeah. Well, over the past three days, the townspeople had undergone aerial bombardment ground invasion, had seen grenades thrown into their homes and hundreds of residents killed, had been living under a curfew, had been abandoned by the Arab Legion, and the able-bodied men had been rounded up. Morris writes that they concluded that living under Israeli rule was not sustainable. No. I would leave too. I, I, I would flee for my life with, you know, whatever I could carry on my back and like, you know. Well, speaking of what you could carry on your back, let's talk about this death march. Oh. So Lida's residents began moving out on the morning of July 13th. They were made to walk perhaps because of their earlier resistance or simply because there were no vehicles left. They walked six to seven kilometers, roughly 20 kilometers in total in high temperatures, carrying their children and portable possessions in carts pulled by animals or on their backs. An IDF soldier describes how possessions and people were slowly abandoned as the refugees grew tired or collapsed. Right, because this is in the middle of like a summer heat wave. And not only that, this is also during Ramadan. Oh, good God. So the people weren't even really drinking water before this happened. Yeah, people are fasting, right? Yeah. And well, it's not just fasting, it's also water. Right, right, yeah. right, right. So to begin with, this is the IDF soldier describing it. To begin with jettisoning utensils and furniture, and in the end, bodies of men, women, and children scattered along the way. So first you drop your possessions, then you drop the old woman that you're bringing with you, then probably your child, and then you die eventually in this like death march, as it's called. 
Uh, reports vary on how many died. Many were elderly and young children who died from the heat and exhaustion. Walid Khalidi gives the figure at 350, citing Palestinian historian Arif al-Arif. Um, so now, according to Ilan Pape, going back to the book, the people of both cities were forced to march without food and water to the West Bank, many of them dying from thirst and hunger on the way. As only a few hundred were allowed to stay in both towns, and given that the people from the nearby villages had fled there for refuge, Robin estimated that a total of 50,000 people had been transferred in this inhuman way. Um, aside from all that, there was also um, accusations of sexual assault. Uh, there were also allegations that Israeli soldiers had sexually assaulted Palestinian women. Ben-Gurion referred to them in his diary entry for July 15th, 1948, where he says, The bitter question has arisen regarding acts of robbery and sexual assault in the conquered towns. Um... You can look this up in um, Haaretz is the name of the Israeli newspaper that they when they went through um, Ben Gurion's diary, you find him detailing sexual assaults that were carried out by the IDF as well as um, is that the pestering yeah. Palestinian neighborhoods so that they are ethnically cleansed. Is that the figure that like he after a while like stops counting? Um, I'm not certain. But we can say this, though, that the Israeli writer Amos Kanan, who served as the commander of the brigade that conquered Lydda, told the nation in 1989, at night, those of us who couldn't restrain ourselves would go into the prison compounds to fuck Arab women. Jesus. Is how, is how he put it. Those of us who couldn't restrain ourselves would go into the prison compounds to fuck Arab women. And that's from the platoon commander of the brigade that conquered the city. Um, and then if you're wondering how the Israeli government uh, fielded those allegations, they were given little consideration. And the agricultural minister, Aharon Zisling, told the cabinet on July 21st, it has been said that there were cases of sexual assault in Ramla. I could forgive acts of sexual assault, but I won't forgive other deeds, which appear to be much graver. When a town is entered and rings are forcibly removed from fingers and jewelry from necks, that is a very grave matter. Dude, what the fuck? So this guy who is the agriculture minister uh, in July said that, Hey, they said that there was sexual assault. I can forgive sexual assault. I'm not, you know, I'm not, what am I going to, you know, boy, pretty, boys will be boys. You know, my soldiers, you know, they're the spoils of war, or as they say, uh, so, pretty much saying I can forgive that. I feel like it's been a minute since, you know, I, I last said this while, while we've been recording this, but like these people have been for the last like 20 odd years, if not longer, right. Just immiserated mm -hmm. economically, politically, right disarmed right they have had their land taken from them they have no means of of speaking for themselves or representing themselves right they they have very little of anything and now like they're being like pushed out of their their land and it's just like this will reverberate for generations oh yes of course and like people want to act as if like you know well why can't you just get along <laughs> yeah yeah th and that's like the liberal thing of being like both sides need to Bo just you know both sides need to just like calm down mm -hmm. and it's just like I, I i think if you have never read anything about this period of history you know in the israeli you know palestinian conflict right i i i, I think you should before speaking on anything contemporaneous yeah so I think we've detailed enough massacres. You know what I mean? Like you get the idea of what it's, was happening. It, 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 it's so dark. Um, so let's move forward into this new thing. So now the United Nations at this point is like, oh shit. Uh, Fuck. What we were, what we decided to do here is not working out. This is not what we intended. Shit is going, the shit is hitting the fan right now. So it's one like of England, these, what did you leave One us? of these UN, UN diplomats is named Count Folk Bernadette. So Folk Bernadette was a Swedish nobleman and diplomat in World War II. And in World War II, he negotiated the re release of about 31,000 prisoners from German concentration camps. So this guy was an active diplomat in the UN, a Swedish guy. And during World War II, he was like, you know, he was, getting... He was, he was a mover and a shaker. Yeah, getting concentration camp yeah. releases done and stuff. So when this Israel-Palestine thing was happening, they... Um, um, employed him to be like, we need you. You're the guy that's yeah. going to go in there. And you help know, us. the art of the deal. Yeah. Uh, we need you. Yeah. To <laughs> so after the war, Bernadette was unanimously chosen to be the United Nations security council mediator in the Arab Israeli conflict of 1947 to 1948. So he comes in there. He's trying to strike up a truce. Right. And one thing he suggests though, 
he suggests a truce. Everybody needs to chill. But he also says that the refugees need to come back. Right. There's so many refugees. This this violates the original partition plan. We weren't right. supposed to take any more fucking land. You weren't supposed to kick people out and take the possessions. We Not need to mention to, this is going to make the surrounding regions yeah. like worse off, yeah. you know? So like, you would assume this guy was probably exalted and, and, and praised for what he was doing, right? Right, right. He was assassinated in Jerusalem in 1948 oh. by the paramilitary Zionist group of the Stern Gang while pursuing his official duties. So this dude Could you like, imagine if like a Palestinian terrorist murdered a UN mediator? Like... <laughs> Not to mention, do you remember all that other shit that I talked about them doing? Yeah. All the all the officials, like Spanish viceroys and lords and all these people uh, yeah. that are just getting fucking clapped by Zionist paramilitaries. It, it, it's it, it's just kind of like... And now murdering, <laughs> assassinating UN mediators. What? After you already have a state as well. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's already been established. Like any so, other country, I feel like, would have been invaded by now. Right. So, exactly, like, the West would have come in and been like, this is fucking absolutely untenable, what's going on Right, here. like, look at what, everything that, like, you know, uh, the U.S. did in, like, Central America, South America, right, and right. the Caribbean, look at everything that, like, you know, they were willing to do in Italy, in France, in Germany, like... Yeah. So, let's see what Ian Pape has to say about this specific chapter here. So, one United Emissary was different. Count Folk Bernadette had arrived in Palestine on May 20th and stayed there until uh, Zionist terrorists murdered him in September for having dared to put forward a proposal to redivide the country in half and to demand the unconditional return of all the refugees. He had already called for the refugees' repatriation during the first tru truce, which had been ignored, and when he repeated his recommendation in the final report, he submitted to the UN, he was assassinated. Still, it is thanks to Bernadette that in December 1948, the UN General Assembly posthumously adopted his legacy and recommended the unqualified return of all the refugees Israel had expelled, one of a host of UN resolutions Israel has systematically ignored. Yeah. So the same body that granted them their state in December 1948, and you hear about this a lot if you follow Israel-Palestine, the right of return. And I thought that this was something, that, which means the right of Palestinian refugees to return to the land right. and homes that they were cleansed Th from. That they are saying, or that yeah. they put forth. Exactly. But actually, as of December 1948, this is literally enshrined in United Nations Resolution 194. And it says here, I'll quote it. The UN General Assembly resolves that the refugees wishing to return to their homes and live at peace with their neighbors should be permitted to do so at the earliest practicable date and that compensation should be paid for the property of those choosing not to return and for the loss of damage to property which under the principles of international law and in equity should be made good by the governments or authorities responsible. Is, is there interest? Can you believe, are, are we, are we also quantifying? Can you believe that that's in writing from an international institution? No, to be honest. I mean, especially the, with the way things have gone down since 1948. Until like, I read this book, I had no idea that there was a unequivocal right of return right. passed by the UN in 1948 that has just been systematically ignored. Are, are we sure that like these UN resolutions aren't like a la carte where it's just like you kind of just like, <laughs> yeah. pick and choose? <laughs> so now we move past the massacres. We're kind of like the dust has settled, so to speak, on the right. 1948 war. Right. Let's talk about its aftermath. Okay. So this is from, um, this is from Ian Pape here. And these are some of the most, it's, the, the massacres are troubling, but this after effect is almost equally, if not more troubling. Right. So, although Israel had essentially completed the ethnic cleansing of Palestine by now, the hardships did not end for the Palestinians. About 8,000 spent the whole of 1949 in the prison camps. Others suffered physical abuse in the towns, and large numbers of Palestinians were harassed in numerous ways under the military rule that Israel now exerted over them. Their houses continued to be looted, their fields confiscated, their holy places desecrated, and Israel violated such basic rights as their freedom of movement and expression and equality before the law. So, meanwhile, right after this all happened, it's not like everything was just grand for the Palestinians, you know? No. And this is the problem with this, is that a lot of these topics that we cover... There's not a happy ending at end. Unfortunately, no. this just continues and it gets worse. In this many is respects. probably one of the saddest, un unhappiest, sap saddest, continuing, yeah. horrific things that we've covered. So, 
A common sight in rural Palestine in the wake of the cleansing operations were huge pens in which male villagers ranging from children from the age of 10 to older men up to the age of 50 were being held after the Israelis had picked them out in the search and arrest operations that had now become routine. They were later moved to centralized prison camps. Thousands of Palestinians languished throughout the 1949 in the prison camps where they had been transferred from the temporary pens. So now as there's like this, this kind of like mass incarceration going on immediately after all these massacres. And then, you know, this whole time that we've been talking about the, Ur the Haganah and the Ergun and the Stern gang. And it's like, there might be this way to be like, Oh, uh, but those were extremist groups. Right. They were outside of the purview. Of, right. They weren't like officially part of but like then the, the. It was decided to employ mainly ex Ergun and ex Stern gang troops as camp guards. Oh. Like, this is the reason why I highlight that so much. Because you might be able to sidestep that and be like, that wasn't the IDF. That was. We don't. We can't keep track of those guys. Now, and at now many times, are... the official Israeli leadership criticizes them. They say, we right. denounce that. That yeah. was not good. But then they employ them to work as camp guards in, their, in these new prison camps. Now they're literally on the payroll. Exactly. Exactly. So. At one point, senior ex Haganah officer Yiska Shadmi was found guilty of murdering two Palestinian prisoners. In October 1956, Yat Shadmi was one of the principal perpetrators of the Kafar Qasim massacre in which 49 Palestinians lost their lives. He escaped punishment for his part in the massacre and went on to become a high-ranking official in the government apparatus that managed the state's relations with its Palestinian minority. He was acquitted eventually in 1958. Yeah, no, he sounds qualified for... This reminds me of uh, Elliot Abrams, who like got convicted in uh, the Iran Contra yeah. under Trump being the U.S. special diplomat to Venezuela, <laughs> it's like how this guy, how is this the guy? Well, and they're like, well, actually, you don't understand. He's perfect. He probably knows the yeah. best. <laughs> so now we just talked about um, prisons, right? Yeah. But even worse, still worse the labor camps. The idea of using Palestinian prisoners as forced labor came from the Israeli military command and was endorsed by the politicians. The authorities used the prisoners in any job that could help strengthen both the Israeli economy and the army's capabilities. Now, that was in um, that was in the book. Wikipedia corroborates this and says, After one of their early visits... On November 11, 1948, Red Cross officials reported dryly that POWs were exploited in the general local effort to strengthen the Israeli economy. So now you have the Red Cross, the International Red Cross. Which, like, you know, isn't great, but, like, you There's know. still a little bit more unbiased. It's not like it's coming from right. just the Israeli side or just the Palestinian side. It's like... Right. So, well, let's talk about this, because it goes even further. So here is a um, little report out of um, the Journal of Palestine Studies, and it's called the ICRC, which stands for International Committee of the Red Cross. So okay. IRC means the Red Cross. Right, right, right. And the detention of Palestinian civilians in Israel's 1948 POW labor camps. So just the excerpt of this, we're not going to read the whole thing, obviously. Right. The internment of thousands of Palestinian civilians in Israeli-run prisoner of war camps is a relatively little-known episode in the 1948 war. This article begins to piece together the story from the dual perspective of the former civilian internees and of the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC. Aside from the day-to-day -day treatment of the internees, ICRC reports focused on the legal and humanitarian implications of civilian internment and on Israel's resort to forced labor to support its war effort. Most of the 5,000 or so Palestinian civilians held in four official camps were reduced to conditions described by one ICRC official as slavery. Dog. And then expelled from the country at the end of the war. Notwithstanding their shortcomings, the ICRC records cons co records constitute an important contribution, contribution to the story of these prisoners and also expose the organization's ineffectiveness. Absent a legal framework, as well as enforcement mechanisms beyond moral persuasion, the ICRC could do little to intervene on behalf of the internees. So, not only do you have Ian Pape saying this, not only do you have Palestinians saying this, the International Committee for the Red Cross, who was on the ground during this, said that these conditions were slavery. Slavery. Not, and I'm not making that up, that is the quote. Right, these that aren't our words, these are the, the, the International... The records Red of the International um, Committee of the Red Cross. Correct. Like... You would think that, like the the Palis you would think that, like the Palestinians, like had you know, had had, had you know, 
I don't know, been an ally of Nazi Germany or something. Like, with, yeah. like, it's just like. Well, actually, the Stern gang were actually the allies of Nazi Which Germany. Is... They were, like, hyped. They, they were what really the working on What the fuck? What the fuck? So, um,. Continuing, let's see what, because now we're talking about this aftermath situation where on one hand we talked about the the, the prisons the, or like the pen, concentration camps is really what they should be called. Then we're talking about the forced labor camps. Now let's talk about the looting that existed. So under the cover of curfews and closures, the Israeli, this is from Elon Pape, by the way, the Israelis also committed other crimes in Jaffa which were representative of much that went on elsewhere. So right now we're just looking at what happened in Jaffa and then we're extrapolating and we're assuming that this happened in other places as well. Right. The most common crime was looting of both the systemic official kind and the sporadic private one. The systemic and official kind was ordered by the Israeli government itself and targeted the wholesale stores of sugar, flour, barley, wheat, and rice that the British government kept for the Arab population. The booty was taken into, sent into Jewish settlements. Reporting in July to Ben-Gurion on how the organized confiscation was progressing, the military governor of Jaffa wrote, As for your demand, sir, that I will make sure that all the commodities required by our army, air force, and navy will be handed over to the people in charge and taken out of Jaffa as fast as possible. I can inform you that as on May 15th, 1948, an average load of 100 trucks a day is taken out of Jaffa. The port is ready for operation. The storehouses were emptied and the goods were taken out. Um... So, systemic robbery also of, like, everything that they had. Now we're going to go into sexual assault. This is a long portion on sexual assault. So, you know, um, I don't know, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll edit, like, a little bit into this and just be like, if you want to skip this, just skip, like, the next, like, five minutes. It's, it, it gets somewhat graphic. Not, like, in detail, but just it's... Yeah. It's it's it's, it's, it's bru- rough. It's brutal what happens here. So um, definitely take that into consideration moving forward. But as Ian Pape says, we have three kinds of sources that report on sexual assault. It remains more difficult to form an idea of how many m- women and young girls were victimized by Israeli troops in this way. Our first source is the international organizations such as the UN and the Red Cross. A Red Cross official, De Murian, reported how Israeli soldiers had sexually assaulted a girl and killed her brother, Yitzhak Chitzik wrote to Kaplan in the letter mentioned above, and about the sexual assault, sir, you probably have already heard. In an earlier letter to Ben-Gurion, Chizik reported how a group of soldiers had burst into a house, killed the father, injured the mother, and sexually assaulted the daughter. Um, The second source that we can use is the Israeli archives, which only cover cases in which the the assaulters, the abusers, were brought to trial. David Ben-Gurion seems to have been informed about such cases and entered them into his diary. Every few days, he has a subsection, a subsection of sexual assault cases. One of these records, the incident Chizik had reported to him, a case in Accra where soldiers wanted to sexually assault a girl. They killed the father, wounded the mother, and the officers covered for them. At least one soldier sexually assaulted the girl. So th- this isn't even like, you know, oh, well, you know, it's not like he knew. It's like, yeah, it no, seems like more of like an inventory. It seems like you're writing down the canned goods you have in a closet. You're like, and then they killed this one and right. they sexually assaulted the girl. And, l- yeah. l- like, I, this is horrendous. It gets worse. So our third oral history is what we have from both the victimizers and the victims. The perpetrators can only talk, it seems, shielded by the safe distance of years. This is how a particularly appalling case came to light just recently. On August 12, 1949, a platoon of soldiers in the Negev captured a 12-year-old Palestinian girl and locked her up for the night in their military base. For the next few days, she became the platoon's sex slave. As the soldiers shaved her head, gang sexually assaulted her, and in the end murdered her. Ben-Gurion lists this incident, too, in his diary, but it was censored out by his editors. On October 29, 2003, the Israeli newspaper Haaretz publicized the story based on the testimonies of the assaulters. 22 soldiers had taken part in the barbaric torture and execution of the girl. When they were then brought to trial, the severest punishment in the court handed down was a prison term of two years for the soldier who had done the actual killing. This is a 12-year-old girl, by the way. 12 years old. And we can't even rule out that this was isolated. I would say that it's certainly not. I would say that everything that we've been reading is that this right. was extremely, this was widespread. The, I would the, say this is it rampant. seems like the, if you're, if you're going to listen to the red cross, if you're going to listen to the Ben Gurion diary, if you're going to listen to the survivor testimonies, this is probably far more uh, pervasive than this one incident. Right. So, and even worse, here is the Haritz article that they mentioned where this is brought to light. And the quote says, I saw fit to remove her from the world. 
Um, and it states newly revealed documents obtained by Haritz tell the long hidden story of what Ben Gurion described as a horrific atrocity. In August 1949, an IDF unit caught a Bedouin girl, held her captive in a Negev outpost, gang assaulted her, executed her at the order of the platoon commander, and buried her in a shallow grave in the desert. Twenty soldiers who took part in the episode, including the platoon commander, were court martialed and sent to prison. But we also know that what this doesn't say is that none of them really served any time except for the one person who actually took her life, who did two years. Only two years. It reminds me so much of the My Lai Massacre. You know what I mean? Like, if you yeah. actually, like, learn about, like, the My Lai Massacre yeah, yeah. where things like this happened and there was such, like, a pitiful attempt to punish the people that did it. Well, I mean, you know, Colin Powell, that's that's his name. He uh, started his legal career defending them and, uh, you know, he really uh, knocked that one out of the park. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, as grim as that is, you know, we, we've talked about the prisons, the, or the, the concentration camps, the forced labor, the looting, and the sexual assault. Now we're going to talk, this is actually very interesting, because we can actually talk about maybe a totality of financial damages because of uh, this systemic ethnic cleansing. Right. So, but return or resettlement was not the issue. There was also the question of the money expropriated from the 1,300,000 Palestinians whose finances had been invested in banks and institutions that were all seized by the Israeli authorities after May 1948. A member of the committee was the first governor of the National Bank, David Horowitz, and he estimated the combined value of property left by the Arabs at 100 million pounds. So this is something that I feel like a lot of people don't think of in this. These were communities that right. had banks, money, equity, um, um, capital in terms of like, uh, right. uh, uh, you know, your business, the, your holdings. The, the, these are all cities that have been consistently occupied by people for over a millennia yeah. with infrastructure, yes. with uh, an economy. Exactly. Right. This wasn't just like, you know, uh, the, the stereotypical house. sepia tone desert, you exactly. Know, with with some, like a bunch of like yeah. nomads yeah, rolling through like it that were riding out. on a camel. Exactly. You know, like exactly. The, it's, so I found this here, which is a really interesting study that came out called Palestinian losses in 1948, 1948 compensation valuations and Israel's ability to pay. So it, this here puts that total property losses at a roughly $2 billion. That's in 1948. What? That's in 1948 dollars that it says two billion. There's been a lot of inflation, man. Three like... billion in total losses. So let's break down the paragraph out of that. The Palestinian economy, which Israel usurped in 1948, was a viable and thriving economy with a significant flow of output and income that sustained a growing population of approximately two million people. The Zionist claim that Palestine was an empty and barren land is contradicted by the substantive and authoritative works of R. Loftus, R. Nathan, and the Survey of Palestine that estimated the net domestic product of Palestine to have exceeded $123 million in, in 1944, with commerce, manufacturing, and agriculture contributing almost equal shares this income in 1944 translates into a total wealth estimate of over 3.1 billion using a modest 4% real rate of interest in the same year's price. The Arab share of this wealth is roughly estimated at 51.2% using Loftus's calculation of this share in total Palestinian net domestic product at the time. It follows that the Arab share of this wealth was about 1.6 billion in 1944 and multiples of this in 2008 as estimated by Theory Schneckel. Dog, like, you know how we talk about, like, uh, sometimes, right, about how, uh, like, Iraq or Libya or, you know, Syria mm -hmm. or any of these other countries or even, like, Afghanistan, honestly, like, you know, if not fucked with, right, would be, like, thriving economies well, with, think like, about mostly... the continent of Africa. We, the continent Africa. of Africa is the yeah. most resource-rich area when it comes to uranium and cobalt and lithium. Like, and this has been through successive generations also. Yeah. During, uh, you know, the 1800s, when, you know, before rubber, there was diamonds, there was ivory, there right. was tin, there was copper, there was all these things. Then in the, the industrial, and then in the industrial age, it had rubber. Right. The, the, what was so sought after during that. Now, Oil. cobalt, lithium, diamond, it's all there. Yeah. And it's the poorest place on earth. Right. Even though it's filled with like every... The hottest commodities in the right. entire world. Including are oil. Are found right there. Are found right there. And it's the poorest, most immiserated place in the world. Right. But like, you know, it, it's, you know, the the fault of the, the, the people in these countries. Yeah. They just, they, they don't know what to do. Yeah. It, it seems more and more... 
right? The more you learn about like the world, it's like, no, no, they actually, I, I think, had a pretty decent idea of what to do with these things. It's yeah. just uh, some other party living outside of yeah. the, these places decided, uh, actually, uh, we know more about what to do with them. So this brings us to our conclusion. Right. Um, the end of the book will tie this together with a lot of stuff like the Intifada, the second Intifada, the PLO, the war, the 1967 war with Egypt that came up. We're not going to have the time or the energy to talk about that here. But what we should all know, as a result of the 1948 war, 750,000 Palestinian were, Palestinians were cleansed right. from the state of Palestine. Palestine today does not exist. Israel has continued to push and push the borders and has, has just immiserated or has, and has just confined the, what's left of the Palestinian population right. to the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. The Gaza Strip is the most densely populated place on earth. Right. They are essentially living in an open air occupied prison. Israel controls who comes in and out what comes in and out. They don't allow certain things for agriculture in. They don't allow equipment in for agriculture. They control the water aquifers. Um, they are completely under military authoritarian control. And, and that's if they aren't in the refugee camps. Right. There are still Arabs, that, uh, there are still Palestinians that have existed for decades in refugee camps in Lebanon and Syria. Um, and even to this day, you can go in this very year they are still illegally building Israeli settlements in the West Bank, further encroaching right. on the Palestinian, what's left of the Palestinian um, population. Uh, just as we were producing this, which is in two weeks, the, the IDF launched its largest incursion into, I think, the West Bank, in Jenin so, yeah. of the West Bank, in like 20 yeah. years. This is ongoing. And, 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 and more, even more recently, they're now suspending their own courts. Yeah, and like, I don't know. Sh shockingly, they're, um, you know, not very big fans of uh, democracy, even for their own people. Yeah. And, you know, and this the, the plight of the Palestinians is relevant to this very second. Yes. And understanding the, the, the present plight of the Palestinians is it is essential to understand the history of Palestine and hopefully this little thing that we just did here, right? maybe this like two, three hour thing that's going to be out on YouTube yeah. will help you to understand that perspective yeah. a little bit. And again, this is largely something inspired from the book that we read. So right. if, you, if you think that this is biased, it probably is biased. We yeah. are taking this book and kind of taking what the, 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 the perspective of, uh, uh, perspective is of this book and just looking into it, finding the facts of the matter, putting it out there, and hopefully it's helpful. Um, we're going to honestly, like, look in terms of bias, right? If you can have a bias to, uh, the other side of, of our bias after learning about the systemic yeah. destruction, the systemic assault, right? From every possible way on these people, right? Like, I don't know, man. Like, Fuck you. Get get help. <laughs> get help. Like, um, what's wrong with you? So we're going to end this. And I'm going to end this with the words of Ian Pape. We end this book where we began. With the bewilderment that this crime was so utterly forgotten and erased from our minds and memories. But we now know the price. The ideology that enabled the depopulation of half of Palestine's native people in 1948 is still alive and continues to drive the inexorable, sometimes indiscernible cleansing of those Palestinians who live there today. Neither Palestinians nor Jews will be saved from one another or from themselves if the ideology that drives the Israeli policy towards the Palestinians is not correctly identified. The problem with Israel was never its Jewishness. Judaism has many faces, and many of them provide a solid basis for peace and cohabitation. It is its ethnic Zionist character. Zionism does not have the same margins of pluralism that Judaism offers, especially not for the Palestinians. They can never be part of the Zionist state and space and will continue to fight, and hopefully their struggle will be peaceful and successful. If not, 
it will be a desperate and vengeful and like a whirlwind will suck all up in a, hu a huge perpetual sandstorm that will rage not only through the Arab and Muslim worlds, but also within Britain and the United States. The powers which each in their turn feed the tempest that threatens to ruin us all. From the river to the sea. Um, this has been the first Subversive History podcast. I hope you enjoy it. Um, yeah. I hope that, maybe leave some comments and let yeah. us know what you liked, what you didn't like about it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I hope that like, you know, the books that we cover offer like, you know, a context, a nuance, right. To the, uh, to, 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 to the, the social constructs, right. To the material constructs that we live in today. And hopefully it gives you like a better understanding of the world that is happening around you all the time, every day. I hope that like we can inspire you to continue to learn, you know, and continue to have a better understanding about how to move forward. Yeah, maybe read a book every now and then. You know it's, what I mean? That's really you. like the underlying philosophy yeah. of this. Is like even if you disagree with us, yeah. get a book that disagrees with us. You know what right. I mean? Like, you know, educate yourself in a right. in a in a in a in a strong like make education a recreational activity. Right. That's that's the way that I talk about it. It's like you can go to school and people look at school like it's four years of like labor that you have to put in and I can't wait to be done it like education should be something that you blissfully engage in on a daily basis right and that is my perspective and you know um feel free to check us out on twitch yeah on twitch uh youtube obviously at subversive history yeah and, you'll, um, you'll definitely be able to find us there um you know we're on twitter at uh subversive hist one yeah uh we're uh you know we got a Facebook page floating around out there. We got an Instagram floating around out there. Feel free to support in any way you can if you like what we did. If you don't like what we did, why don't you comment? I think that helps in the algorithm, even if you're talking <laughs> shit. So feel free to throw us a uh, a, a comment. And um, I think next we're going to try to set up a, the next one of these on Marks at the Margins by yeah. Kevin Anderson. So I think we're going to do our next one hopefully in the next few weeks yeah. uh, where we talk about that. So yeah, thank you so much for stopping by. Law Salam. La Stay Salam. strong out there.